Anyway, uh, so I'll get started. So welcome everyone to my grand rounds today. The topic I chose to uh, talk about to you is impacted esophageal food boluses. I'm deep in my R5 studying, so I wasn't able to come up with anything too much more interesting for my title today. Uh, so I'll start it off. I'd like to thank Dr. Clemente, uh, one of our recent grads, for being my um, supervisor for this. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm Jen. I'm one of the current PGY-5s in the Royal College program. So we'll start off with the case and you're working in the periphery. Uh, it's five o'clock, your shift is ending um, and your next patient to be seen is a 77 year old female coming in with the chief complaint of a foreign body sensation after eating chicken earlier in the day. Does one of our R2s wanna walk me through what kind of information you might wanna gather next? How about Rob? You're the first one I see. Oh, you're an R3. That's okay, you can still do it. Sure, uh, so I'll um, probably just start with a basic history physical, um, get a sensation of where they, they feel the food bolus is, uh, is stuck, uh, if they otherwise look well, or if there's any concerns about a perforation, probably doing things like a chest x-ray, see if I can locate the foreign body, see if they're tolerating any their oral secretions, and then usually talking to GI. Good, so you ask her a little bit more about it. So she consumed the chicken at 9.30 that morning. She's not complaining of any pain or shortness of breath. She just feels like it's stuck uh, deeper down. Her vital signs are all stable and she's showing no signs of respiratory distress and she's handling her secretions well. She's 77, but otherwise relatively healthy, just treated for hypertension and dyslipidemia. And she's never had an episode like this similar uh, in the past. So just a little bit of a quick review on the esophageal anatomy. So there's three places that um, foreign objects are most likely to be um, caught. And those are our three anatomic narrowing. So the first one's your upper esophageal sphincter. Um, the next is where your aortic arch and your left main stem bronchus cross the aorta. And then the last one is at the diaphragmatic hiatus or your lower esophageal sphincter. Um, looking into most textbooks, they quote a number of about 90% of all people having a foreign body caught have some kind of pre-existing structural abnormality. Um, and so that's right from Rosen's. And it talks about anything from strictures to mucosal rings to a, um, esophagitis. Um, so many of these people probably have something underlying going on. Looking into Rosen's, they are, so looking into up to date, they quote very similar facts. Um, so proximal one third is quite rare actually, and these tend to be just something related to your central nervous system uh, or a Zanker's diverticulum. Your middle third is starting to become a little bit more frequent. Uh, you start to see some of your cancers, your uh, esophagitis, your radiation strictures, but it's the distal third that is actually the most common. So at the lower esophageal sphincter there, and this is the site of a lot of the strictures, rings, cancer, and echolasia. So a lot of our foreign bodies are actually gonna be caught at this distal one third. Um, imaging, most food boluses are not seen on plain films, um, and even fish bones and chicken bones often aren't actually seen. So there's limited role for actually using imaging um, for actually identifying your food bolus, and endoscopy can be performed without obtaining uh, radiographs. Plain films should be considered, kind of as Rob mentioned, if you're concerned about anything such as perforation or the patient's in any kind of respiratory distress. You can also consider it if you're not sure what the foreign body is and you think that it might be radio opaque. Uh, reading into the guidelines for endoscopy, so Rob brought up calling GI to get uh, a scope done. The American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopists talk about a complete obstruction requiring emergent removal, um, however, incomplete obstruction. So patients who are able to tolerate their secretions, they're not in respiratory distress, can be removed up to 24 hours. And after this 24 hour mark, you're at increased risk of complications such as perforation, fistulas, and abscesses. Um, just reading a little bit further into some of the guidelines, the European Society also backs this up and say they kind of further define it that a complete obstruction also needs an emergent um, removal. However, they further define this saying emergent is two hours, but at the latest six. Um, and again, they say incomplete obstructions require removal within 24 hours. Um, so that kind of leaves us to say, what can we do in those 24 hours? Is there anything we can do to help remove 
help it pass spontaneously prior to doing our endoscopy. And so I looked a little bit more into glucagon. Um, so the pathophysiology behind glucagon is that it relaxes the smooth muscles, allowing for passage of food bolus. Um, so remembering our um, esophageal anatomy, the upper third is actually striated muscle. So glucagon won't work on those upper third constrictions. However, they are much less rare. And it's our lower two thirds that are actually the smooth muscle um, where glucagon is actually working. Uh, remembering though that glucagon is associated with side effects such as vomiting, uh, aspiration, and perforation. Uh, the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopy, um, their comments on glucagon is that it's relatively safe and remains an acceptable option, but it essentially shouldn't delay your definitive management, which is endoscopy. Um, the other agent that we sometimes use is effervescent agents or our easy gas or gas X. These are gas forming agents. So the thought behind these is that by increasing um, your pressure in your esophagus, your upper um, esophageal sphincter is closed. So when your pressure increases in that lumen, the only place for it to go is down and it pushes that food product into the stomach. Um, so we use easy gas here. Literature is very small behind it. And there is a the theoretical uh, potential that that increased pressure causes perforation. Um, so going back to this case, this patient was given easy gas and glucagon um, and very shortly after started vomiting with bloody saliva. Uh, this was followed by persistent sharp chest pain um, and you repeat our vital signs and they are as follows. Um, do one of the other R3s want to talk me through what they think is going on here and what they would want to do next? How about Taylor? So with the sharp chest pain, um, tachycardia, increased respiratory rate, um, after the easy gas, it's concerning for an esophageal perforation or esophageal tear. Um, so I'd get an emergent chest x-ray. I'd also probably send off um, ACS labs at this point as well, just in case there is something else going on at that time. Uh, get an ECG urgently as well. Good. So here's your chest x-ray. Um, not too remarkable, but there is a little effusion starting uh, here that you can see. Uh, and then here's her blood work. So you hadn't drawn blood work before because she looked otherwise well, but you know obviously now her white count is quite elevated and her lactate is as well. Um, so very rightfully so concerning for an esophageal perforation. So this was a real case that was um, seen and sent into London um, after getting an esophageal perforation post uh, easy gas and um, glucagon. So this kind of prompted me to look at what is the actual benefit behind these agents? I know a lot of um, staff I've talked to have quoted, well, the evidence isn't very good. The evidence isn't very good. Some people use it, other people don't. But I didn't really have a good understanding about what that evidence was and kind of to help me decide if I ever wanted to use it in the future, I decided to do my grand rounds looking into the literature behind it. So I started with a Cochrane review, thinking Cochrane review, it's got to be pretty good. So they looked at the conservative management behind um, esophageal soft food boluses, and this was just done in 2020. They were able to identify almost 900 records, of which they almost immediately excluded 809 for being irrelevant. Afterwards, they applied their strict eligibility criteria, which is, was that it had to be a randomized control trial. Um, and only one study actually met that criteria. So this whole Cochrane review is only based on one study. And so at the end of the whole review, they essentially say yet yeah, they can't recommend it because there's inadequate data. There's inadequate data against the potential side effects and caution should be exercised when using any conservative management strategies. So there wasn't too much in the Cochrane review to recommend, recommend it, but they also comment that there isn't really a lot of data. Well, I am going to present a lot of the papers that are out there currently. There's a lot of numbers and I hope you guys don't get lost too many in them. I try to point out the strengths and weaknesses of most of the studies and at the end kind of try to pull them all together for you. So I hope I don't throw too many numbers at you, but there's a lot of papers that I reviewed. The first one is um, published in 1995 in the Journal of Dysphagia. So this was the one and only randomized control trial that the Cochrane Review actually commented on. It was done out of four Swedish centers and actually only had 43 patients. They either got glucagon and diazepam. So glucagon was not used as a solo agent. It was used with the benzodiazepine as well. And it compared it to a placebo control. Um, 
to be in, to be included in this study, you actually had to have uh, imaging that showed you had a foreign body, though they don't clearly define their criteria for imaging, but they did comment all these patients had Im imaging confirmed foreign bodies. And they also excluded all patients with known esophageal strictures. Um, so they had a fairly selective patient population, which doesn't necessarily correlate to the patients we're gonna see in eMERGE, because we're not often gonna have that advanced imaging and we're not often gonna know if they have esophageal rings or not. Um, they, their endpoint was rate of disimpaction, but again, they don't really define how they measured that disimpaction, whether it was endoscopy confirmed, whether it was patient um, sensation, whether it was repeat imaging, they just say that it was rate of disimpaction. Um, and they had that in, disimpaction had to be within the first hour, and then they prepped them for endoscopy. Only four patients between both groups disimpacted within the first hour. And then afterwards, they prep them for endoscopy. But again, they don't really let us know how long that endoscopy took. So many more of these successes actually occurred outside that initial hour. This study also didn't comment on any adverse events, including aspiration, perforation, um, or mortality. Um, so that was the only randomized control study. This was a really good table put together by Rabel EM, where they looked at all of the different studies um, outside of this um, randomized control that looked at glucagon. Um, so there are a reasonable number of them. All of them are retrospective reviews, and they have a wide variation on success rates. So it's anything from 9.4 to 39.5%. Um, so very different. Many of them don't compare them to any kind of placebo. So we don't know if that's actually truly glucagon or some of these would pass spontaneously on their own. And many of them don't comment on any side effects such as nausea or vomiting. Uh, so I just broke down some of more of these studies. So this was one published in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2016. Um, so again, it was a retrospective review and it looked at all patients with any esophageal um, foreign body. So this included things outside of food. It wasn't just a food impaction, though 89%, a large majority of them were actually food. Um, the majority of the patients, 127 versus 29, actually got glucagon. So whatever the um, practice pattern at this hospital was, it was clearly favored towards glucagon. Um, but the median age of glucagon was much lower in this group. 35 compared to 55. The rest of the baseline characteristics um, were otherwise similar. However, they didn't comment on any history of similar events, which may suggest that these patients have underlying um, structural abnormality. The primary outcome was again resolution of symptoms with 60 minutes. So they kept their um, positive outcomes to be in this quite tight range past 60 and anything that would have passed spontaneously after 60 minutes was not considered a success and the uh, author's rationale behind that was that the peak action of glucagon is 60 minutes um, so anything after that kind of peak action could theoretically be attributed to just uh, watchful waiting so they kept their resolution within that time frame um, so this was one of the less successful studies showing only 14.2 percent compared to 10.3 with no significant difference between glucagon and control uh, they comment on adverse events being vomiting um, which was again quite high at 12 percent especially considering success rate was only 14 percent as many people vomited almost as successfully passed um, and they didn't actually um, describe vomiting in the control group. So we don't know how much of this is from possibly the foreign body itself versus possibly getting glucagon. Um, and they didn't comment on any other um, adverse events. Vomiting was the only one. Ultimately, 85 to 90 percent of both groups still needed endoscopy. So there was still a high number of endoscopies performed. Um, and again, it was, they were prepped within the first hour, but it's unclear when these endoscopies actually happened. Um, no major events were reported with endoscopy. Uh, so this study uh, was published in 2016 in the Digestive Diseases and Sciences Journal. Um, patients were identified as having a foreign body in the esophagus, but this was limited to food and medications. Um, 750 patients were identified and the mean age was 56 and the mean duration was 6.4 hours. Um, so this just breaks down how they um, the different patients in the group. Um, so the thing that I found most striking about this study was that they defined their success as subjective passing of the food bolus 
or seeing the food bolus in the stomach when they scoped them. So they didn't actually, glucagon could still be successful, but not avoid an endoscopy for these patients, which to me is in a very patient-centered outcome because we're trying to use glucagon to avoid endoscopy for these patients. Um, so it's not clear if you add up all these numbers, they don't, they add up to more than 750 because there's a lot of crossover in these technical successes that would still have gotten an endoscopy. So it's not really clear by just looking at this data, um, how many patients avoided endoscopy by getting glucagon. So though they report a success of 39%, um, some of these patients still ended up getting endoscopy, um, which I thought was uh, interesting. Uh, of these glucagon administrations, um, 11 cases of reported emesis, but again, they didn't really comment on any other complications. Um, and then of the group that underwent endoscopy, they commented on a fairly high number of um, esophageal abnormalities. Um, so 31% had some form of ring stricture narrowing, 27% had erosive esophagitis, and 11% had eosinophilic esophagitis. And it's unclear if these were all separate patients or if there was some overlap between the two groups, but somewhere between 31 and 69% of these patients have some kind of esophageal abnormality when they're scoped. Um, of the patients who got endoscopy, uh, there were no perforations and one patient did aspirate. Um, so moving on to the next one. So this was also a retrospective case series um, done over 25 years, but only kind of getting 222 patients. Uh, so still relatively smaller sizes. Uh, glucagon um, was successful in 9.4% versus control was 17. This study actually never compared the difference between the two groups. So there's no actual p-value ever given for the success of glucagon versus control. And then one thing I found interesting about this study was that about the same number of patients got glucagon as it didn't. So you can see between the different studies, different centers have very widely different practice patterns and how they're choosing to get, give glucagon or not give glucagon. And it's not really clear how they're making those decisions. Um, so this um, table tried to look at the baseline characteristics between patients who got glucagon and didn't get glucagon. So remembering that this is all retrospective, they're trying to see if there's any pattern to how the, um, the um, glucagon is giving given. And there really isn't. Again, the kind of common theme that we're seeing is that we tend to give glucagon to our younger patients. Um, so the mean age in our patients that got glucagon were 53 versus 65. So about 10 or so years younger, but otherwise gender, BMI, um, duration of the impaction, history of similar, they're all similar between the two groups. So we don't really seem to be choosing glucagon based on any of those criteria. Um, then they actually went and they tried to say, of the patients who got glucagon, can we determine any differences in traits between patients who responded versus patients who didn't respond? And again, they had a hard time really pulling out um, too many characteristics that differed between the two groups. They do comment on meat. So patients who succeeded with glucagon had about 70% meat impaction versus the non-responders had 90%, so slightly higher uh, rate of meat in patients who didn't respond. So thinking that kind of harder um, meat food bolus might be harder to dislodge uh, versus vegetable, bread, other softer foods. And then the other thing they comment on was the presence of esophageal rings. So 31% of people who failed glucagon had some form of esophageal ring versus 0% in glucagon non-responders, but only five of the 10 patients who responded to glucagon uh, ended up getting a scope and having documentation. So it's actually not super clear if there's um, abnormalities in those patients who were never scoped. But again, that would make a little bit more sense as well, that patients who are, were not able to dislodge have some kind of fixed obstruction there. Uh, so this was a recent meta-analysis that was put out that looked at a lot of the studies I just went over. So I, I talked about the Tibbling, Soberman, Haas, and Bodkin. Uh, the meta-study was children, and it had um, coins as the foreign body, so I didn't go into that because it wasn't relevant to my talk, but it is included in the systematic review. Um, so just included the forest plots for these. So... Um, you can see they all kind of hover. This is a, a benefits of success. They all kind of hover around one, so not really any difference. Um, and even if you take this one out, I think you'd probably be somewhat similar. They also look at adverse events, and there's a lot less studies included here because many of them don't actually report their adverse events. 
Um, and again, there's more adverse events seen in the glucagon group. Uh, so that was kind of the glucagon studies to look at kind of what evidence there was there. But I also looked at the effervescent agents. So these are our easy gas, gas X. Um, so this was one of the only really good studies. It was um, published in the diseases of esophagus in 2018. Again, retrospective data, and it looked at acute esophageal food boluses. So it had to be food. They defined their success as the um, clearance of impaction, avoiding need for endoscopy. So you had to actually get this agent preventing you from going on to an endoscopy. Um, and patient, that was just based on patient reported symptoms. So ability to swallow secretions and the like sensation that the bolus had actually passed. Uh, so they compared both um, effervescent agents compared to glucagon as well as effervescent agents compared to no therapy. Uh, so 55% succeeded compared to both 17 in both of those two groups. And they um, compared them statistically with significance. Uh, of the patients who got endoscopy, 100% were successful. So this kind of just breaks down the different groups. So when their um, easy gas are the effervescent agents, and it was easy gas in the study that they used, uh, there's about a 55% success rate uh, compared to glucagon was about 17%. They actually looked at the two of them together as well, which lied somewhere in between the two, uh, glucagon and easy gas. And the thought they kind of postulated as to why um, it's less successful when you add glucagon on was because you need to create that pressure in your esophagus to dislodge the foreign body distally. And if you're relaxing the sphincter with glucagon and you're trying to create pressure in the lumen as well, you're kind of counteracting each other when you use the two of them together. So I found that kind of interesting and it made sense to me. Uh, and then of all the people who got the uh, endoscopy, 100% was able to pass. Uh, so again, they tried to compare, was there any differences? This is retrospective. Can we pull out any differences in the groups of who got these agents? And other than age, um, which was on average um, lower in any of the treatment groups, whether it was effervescent or glucagon, compared to no treatments, so we're tending to give active treatment to younger patients. Um, otherwise, there was no difference in any of the therapies uh, in the baseline characteristics. Uh, again, when they looked at the effervescent agent group themselves, they tried to predict, can we determine any of the characteristics that might have predicted success? Um, the only one um, of all of these characteristics that uh, seemed to have any difference was time to therapy. Um, so it, in the patients who succeeded with easy gas, it was about six hours earlier, um, or sorry, it was six hours compared to 14, which is about an eight hour difference. Um, so patients seem to be more successful with easy gas um, the earlier it was given. Uh, again, they commented on of all those patients who were scoped, 30% um, had strict some kind of stricture, 20% had some kind of erosive esophagitis, uh, about 20% had some kind of eosinophilic esophagitis, and just under 10% had a Schatzi ring with present doesn't talk about how many of these overlapped, but you can see a high number of these patients actually do have some kind of abnormality underlying. This is a very big table and not meant to be read. The thing I wanted to highlight was this was a summary that was put out um, by a UK group um, back in 2005, and it kind of summarized all of the data that was out there for um, effervescent agents at that point. And all of these studies are just case controls. They're kind of anywhere from two to 14 patients. So the data is really, really limited. And after this was published, the paper that I presented was one of the only really other um, papers presented. So the data really is even much more limited for effervescent agents than it is for uh, glucagon. So I kind of went over the success, but also the complications of um, the more conservative managements, but every, every procedure has its risks and benefits. So I wanted to look a little bit more into endoscopy and consider was there, um, what are the risks and benefits for endoscopy? Because that kind of matters as well, I believe. So I'm um, reading the American Society of Gastroenterology Endoscopy, so kind of the guidelines that most of our group follows. Um, the adverse event rates for foreign body retrieval. So this is specifically a endoscopy that was meant to retrieve a foreign body. So not a diagnostic endoscopy, but kind of more of an emergency diagnostic um, endoscopy. 
Um, so their adverse event rates for a superficial laceration is less than 2%, GI hemorrhage is less than 1%, and perforation is less than 0.8%. So a relatively safe procedure, and this would be kind of capturing our emergency population with those numbers. I also reached out to our local group um, to ask them a little bit more about what they thought, because often I know you hear lots of stories of, well, this this um, gastroenterologist told me this and this person told me this. So I talked to Dr. Sandu um, and his opinion was that there generally is no evidence to support efficacy for either. So he kind of acknowledged the evidence isn't really great. Um, however, they believe glucagon to be relatively safe. Um, so it's not unreasonable to consider a one milligram IV trial for impactions less than 12 hours. Um, anecdotally, they find effervescent agents less um, useful than glucagon. Um, however, they quoted a 12 hour time period prior to them being scoped. So thinking back when I quoted the guidelines earlier, they, they quoted 24 hours, but the timeline he gave me was 12 hours because after that period of time, you're at increased risk of ulceration. Um, he also said that they guide their opinions by the ASGE, so the American Society of Gastrointestinal Endoscopists that I quoted earlier. So that's kind of the body of literature that they follow as well. And then I just kind of summarized back. So these are the guidelines that they follow. And so I just summarized them back. So they kind of, again, quote, glucagon is relatively safe and remains an acceptable option. Um, but you have to consider your timelines and you don't want to de delay your definitive um, end endoscopy to remove. Uh, so case resolution, patient was transferred uh, to thoracic surgery for management of a Borhaves um, perforation. Uh, this patient ended up having a distal peptic stricture um, and the chicken was lodged at the end of her, like right where her stricture was, but she actually perforated up higher. And that was because of the pressure buildup in her lumen actually caused a higher perforation and she ripped through her striated muscle up higher. She did okay, but she did spend a month in hospital and had to come back multiple times to get her peptic, peptic stricture dilated. So a lot of times these patients who have some kind of esophageal abnormality are going to be needing to get endoscopies anyways for dilation. So if I tried to pull out the bottom line for all of this data, um, so data is poor, it's variable, depending on what study you look, some will say it's successful, others won't, but the data really isn't there. There's only one randomized control trial and all of that data is retrospective. Most sample sizes are very small and many of them lack any kind of control population. So we don't know, is this truly glucagon? Is this more watchful waiting? Um, and there's very poor reporting on adverse outcomes, which um, this case really highlighted that they're, they're definitely possible. Um, and so I think it's important to consider. Um, a high number of patients also have underlying esophageal abnormalities. So if there's 30% of patients who have some kind of fixed stricture distally, glucagon's not going to work because it's not gonna relax that distal stricture. And uh, easy gas potentially, if you blocked your if you've blocked your um, fixed, up, fixed obstruction down below, but you've also blocked your, esoph um, your upper esophageal sphincter, you're gonna be at more risk of perforation just by the nature of that increased pressure has to have somewhere to go. Um, so if I, I would still say glucagon can be considered. It's, it's supported by our experts. There's some data out there that say maybe it works, but I do think we have to consider our patient age. Um, so older patients, potentially more likely to have strictures, um, potentially more likely to have adverse outcomes should they run into more problems. Uh, I would also consider the duration of impact um, with some studies showing that the longer it's there, the more likely you are to have adverse outcomes. Um, and then history of similar episodes are known at anatomic defects. So if a person's coming in saying this has happened before, I would definitely be worried that maybe there's something anatomic there and they would benefit more from a scope. Um, and I'd also wanna consider the patient's ability to protect their airway should they start vomiting. And I think no matter what, I would be calling gastroenterology very early because uh, we know that sometimes they are also very busy and it can take a while to get these scopes arranged. Uh, so I went through that a lot quicker than I expected, but um, I'd like to thank Dr. Clemente who went through all my slides with me and provided me um, 
help with this presentation. Uh, Dr. Kiyabi from the Department of Thoracic Surgery who um, actually gave me this case and talked me through the, the case specifics, uh, as well as Dr. Sandu who gave me his opinion um, on behalf of his gastroenterology colleagues. So I, that's kind of a lot of literature jammed into half an hour. So Zoom isn't the best conversation starter, but if anyone has experience or anecdotes or things different gastroenterologists have told them, I'd love to open it up for a little bit more discussion. Has anyone successfully used any of these agents? Janice, John, um, yeah, over the years, um, I've had a moderate, I would say, maybe probably guessing maybe as much as 25%, 30% success rate using easy gas. Uh, I've not used uh, glucagon because uh, um, of the uh, potential for, for vomiting, which um, can go on for, you know, uh, can be fairly, fairly wicked. And uh, um, uh, so I've, I've avoided that. Uh, um, I, I, I think you've made some really good points here in terms of the age of the patient and, you know, history of pre pre obstructions and so on. I think the, if one was going to use either of the, the you know, an effervescent, effervescent agent or glucagon, um, I think it really should be those, those younger first time patients, um, um, and younger, probably, probably a cutoff of 40 or 50, um, mm -hmm. because that's really the age in, you know, the, the most, most commonly you're going to start seeing esophageal cancers over the age of, of 40. Uh, you know, if you see the, the healthy young person who comes in and, you know, was eating steak and a piece gets stuck because they just frankly aren't chewing their food, uh, I think you're much less likely in that individual to um, to cause a perforation, and there's much less likely going to be underlying pathology which pre would predispose them to a perforation. Um, so that's my experience. My only other comment is right at the beginning you were talking about chest X-rays, um, and personally, I always do a chest X-ray for the reason you mentioned, and also looking to uh, see particularly older patient uh, is there any sign of a mediastinal mass. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm speaking with some of like the services you might consult after, even though, so I kind of stuck that to guidelines a little bit. Um, but if they're going to scope them or if they ever need surgery, they kind of like to have baseline x-rays anyways. Yes. Um, so they're not necessarily mandatory. And I think it's important to realize you probably aren't going to see the esophageal food bolus on them. So no. you're not really doing them to identify food bolus. It's more um, looking at their anatomy, as you said. Yeah. So that's a really good point. I'd be interested to know what other consultants have been doing sort of more recently. Um, and, and actually you, you start off by saying that this patient was in the periphery um, mm -hmm. and that really pushes one more towards doing uh, something rather than just picking up the phone and calling GI because uh, as much as they, they will tell you when you talk to them and ask them, ask them an academic question about what should happen with these patients, uh, when you actually call in, uh, particularly if it's nighttime, weekend, what have you, you may get a certain amount of pushback saying, well, have you tried this? Have you tried that? Um, uh, I think you still have to stick to what you've been talking about, and that is being selective about the patients that you use it on. And perhaps a 77-year-old isn't the best person to be trying it on, because even if there's no underlying pathology, uh, tissues are less pliable and um, mm -hmm. more likely to tear, I would think, in that, mm -hmm. that age group. And they're more likely, they're harder to repair if they get the complication. So if they do actually have a perforation, um, their tissues are much more friable. They're going to be suffering more morbidity from the procedures too, which is, I think, something that we have to consider. Um, this was actually on the 23rd of December, like so kind of leading right into the holidays in the periphery. They were kind of the perfect storm. Um, so that was actually a, very specifically why I put they were in the periphery for that reason, um, was because you do you are going to consider things differently um, depending on where your patient is. Yeah. I think if you again if you're talking to a GI consultant from a small hospital uh, you know outside the you know the scoping center, um, I think you can make a, if you know 
you know, you have at the, in the back of your mind the information that you presented today, uh, not with quoting studies and so on, but just to, mm-hmm. to, to make the case that, you know, this is an older patient, I'm really reluctant to, uh, uh, to use an effervescent agent or glucagon just because of the potential for uh, an esophageal tear. You know, when you put that at the consultant that you're speaking to, um, you know, if they poo-poo it, then that's, you know, at least you've, you've got that to document, you know, recommended by Dr. X that, you know, I go ahead and do this. Um, but um, I think you may, you may undermine their reluctance to, or get by their reluctance to actually accept the patient and do the scope. The other thing that I find interesting is, so the patients who, the, sorry, the physicians who are doing the scopes are the gastroenterologists, but they're also not the ones dealing with the complications. It's going to be the thoracics department. So if you talk to GI, they're probably like, yeah, you can give it a try. But if you talk to thoracics, mm-hmm. they're like, why would you ever do that? Just call GI. So they're kind of relying on their other colleagues. So the GI docs are probably going to say, yeah, you can do it. Cause if they perf, it's not on them per se. Um, but the thoracics colleagues who see this is what they see. They see that negative outcomes are like, well, why would you ever use that? So it's kind of interesting reading, seeing the different opinions from different specialties based on how they deal with the outcomes. Yeah. Um, Hi, Jen. Yeah. It's, Kel- it's Kelly. Um, and I was trained to use both easy gas and glucagon, which I have done in the, it, the types of patients that you described without knowing all of that literature. So thank you for that great uh, review, even though the literature wasn't very robust, it was very helpful. And as John says, it will help my discussions uh, because the pushback is always from GI, have you tried this? So that's kind of formed my opinion. But I would say, and it's purely anecdotally, in those selected patients, less than 12 hours, 50, maybe 55, no previous, and no hint of a bone that could be in their food bolus, I would say more like 40% success. Mm-hmm. And I warn them they're going to throw up. And then I give them a PPI and set them up for urgent GI to get scoped as an outpatient. And I think that's reasonable, especially because a few of the people I've referred to GI Sometimes they're in that hospital for 12 hours. If it's the middle of the day, they've got a bunch of other scopes going on, getting the resources. It can be quite a time consuming process for these patients. So if you can help them out, even if they need to get scoped as an outpatient, I think that's reasonable. And even though the study agree, even though the studies weren't that great, I think just seeing how mm-hmm. the patient, like the patients who had the negative outcomes and maybe what factors are contributing to them helps guide my decisions a little bit more. Because prior mm-hmm. to this, I felt like everyone just had a story or why yeah. would you do this? I'd give it a try. Like I didn't really have a great wrap my head around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think even educating patients when I discussed it with them, I think is I've benefited from it at least. Yeah, well done, thank you. Hi, Jen, it's Laura. I just wanted to add one other comment. Yeah. <clears throat> I agree, I think that the success rates anecdotally have been a little higher than, than maybe what was presented in some of the papers for, for me, but uh, I do feel that the one thing about using easy gas is that you have to be a cheerleader. It's, not, it's totally counterintuitive for someone to shove more stuff in their esophagus, especially something that's foamy, when they're obstructed. So you really have to be their cheerleader, if I think, if you're going to have success. I will also say in those older patients, I have felt kind of apprehensive about using it and reluctant because I'm also concerned they're going to aspirate, frankly, because mm. there's a lot of choking and sputtering that goes on. Uh, and then the final comment I would just say is that doing an emergency endoscopy does take resources away from our emergency department as well. So that's just another factor. If we can safely resolve things, then maybe, uh, you know, we're not taking another nurse away to sit by an endoscopy because usually they have to participate as part of the process as well. And sometimes even we also have to help with sedation. Do you pick your patients wisely? Like how do you, what kind of thoughts, and this doesn't just have to be Laura, but do other people have thoughts on how they are picked? We've talked a little bit about age. Is there any other thoughts people have to how they pick their um, patients? Hey Jen, it's Chantal. Um, I think in terms of picking my patients, I agree I do the young patients. And also if they have a history of recurrently um, obstructing, this is something that's happening. Um, or was kind of building to this where they said it usually feels like it gets stuck, but it moves along. That kind of gives me the idea that they probably have a stricture there and can use the scope. Um, and I'm probably going to have less success actually moving this with um, an effervescent. 
And I did want to say that um, I tend to be an easy gas user. I don't use um, glucagon similar to, I think it was John who said that. Um, but I, with the easy gas, the times that I've had um, some issues with um, success is um, the nurses will sometimes mix the easy gas in the drink before they bring it to the patient. And so by the time it gets to the patient, the react has already happened. Mm -hmm. And so um, I make sure I tell the nurses or even bring it to the bedside myself. They have to take the easy gas um, themselves, put the kind of pop rocks essentially in, and then uh, drink the ginger ale or Coke or whatever you have at the bedside because the reaction has to happen right away in the esophagus. And I found that when the nurses have tried it with that method and then I go do the other ones, sometimes I've had success. Of course, not always. No, that's a really good that's a really good point, Chantel. And I think these are practical things we don't necessarily learn about. So uh. yeah, just to add one little thing, I would just say get them to actually sort of toss the pop rocks, the easy gas, right to the back of their throat, and then take a gulp of the uh, the quickly take a gulp of the, the ginger ale or the coke or whatever, because uh, you got to get them down the esophagus before they really start to foam. Um, the other thing that I kind of asked myself while I was doing this, uh, does anyone, when do you call GI? When do you kind of call your conservative measures of failure? Uh, it's Kelly here. I would just do it once, not repeat it. And the other thing is, if as further to John and Laura's comment, if you have a big green bowl, don't use a little kidney basin and get some towels and sort of uh, prepare your patients that they may have some frothing and or they will have some frothing and and possibly some vomiting it looks like it's all expected as opposed to very unexpected but I would do it once and then call if that was not successful. how long how what period of time would you give them to succeed I, I it's usually pretty evident right away they'll say oh I feel fine I'll give them a glass of water if they can swallow it and they feel okay then I consider that a success and um, it's, it's, I wouldn't wait more than 20 minutes. I think it's pretty evident right after. And I think that makes sense with easy gas more than glucagon. Glucagon, you don't really see that reaction. You're just uh, relaxing their muscles. So, but I think that makes sense to me with easy gas that if you're gonna see success, it's going to be uh, quickly. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a story or a thought or opinion? question. I kind of went through a lot of numbers really quickly, I know, um, but I just wanted to highlight some key points. Hi, Jen, it's Roy here. Mm -hmm. Starship Enterprise. Um, I, I tend to agree with my colleagues. The, uh, the success with easy gas tends to be immediate or soon after you give it. And then I, I would only try it once and then call GI. The chest x-ray, I, I do tend to get a chest x-ray because it is, it is low yield, but um, if, if I am giving somebody easy gas and all the time they've had a mediastinal mass or they've already got a pneumomediastinum or um, they've aspirated already, then uh, it's embarrassing to have given them easy gas and, and uh, one tends to get blamed for something that was already there. So documenting uh, the, the presence of a, a complication before you go ahead and try an intervention, I think is reasonable as well. I, I'd say about 40 or 50% of the time people do tend to, to pass the bolus. And it does tend to be the chosen patients, the ones that are younger, um, ones that I, I would think would have less difficulty with maintaining their airway as, as they're uh, spitting out the foam. So I agree with, uh, with my colleagues. I think for me, it was useful as someone who hasn't had a lot of anecdotal experience um, to hear it kind of from you guys, but also to read the evidence myself. I would agree. I think if we choose our patients, um, we're much less likely to run into these complications. Roy, I can't imagine any of our colleagues and other specialties blaming us for anything. <laughs> no, it's never happened to me, John. Uh, I was just oh, no. my colleagues. Yeah. Great talk, Jen. All right. Well, if there are no more questions or stories, um, we will end there. Thanks, Jen. That was super helpful. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. Good job, Jen.